I hope everyone had a good lunch. I uh, hope everyone's been able to join us back um, online. Um, for this panel, I'm delighted to introduce five speakers, um, including Mikola, Sahi, and Rostislav from Ukraine. We therefore have a mix um, next of online and in-room presentations next. Um, and I would imagine most will agree that the war in Ukraine has drawn more attention towards the environmental impacts of wars and perhaps any other recent conflicts, especially given the nuclear and industrial facilities present in the country. And in this panel, we'll be learning about some of the scope three plus emissions I mentioned in panel one. We'll hear about the technologies, sorry, the techniques used to establish to estimate these emissions from the war zone, as well as its impacts on emissions elsewhere. The panel will present initial results from an assessment and outline um, outline the obvious many challenges and determining impacts from um, emission sources and around data collection and methodologies. We will also be hearing from research on the environmental footprint of World War II and the parallels and technical challenges in such assessments. Um, and first, I'm going to introduce each of the um, presenters just before they speak so everyone can fully taken where they're from. Um, but first, I wanted to just um, ask everybody the question that's not moving forward, Owen. No. Can you see this? OK. Oh, yeah. So um, it's, it is a poll question for people online, but um, maybe just think yourselves. Um, we just wanted to ask you, how do you think emissions caused by Russia's war are contributing are, are distributed over the different sectors? So there's there's four choices there. So just really just have a think about which of those four choices you think represent the distribution of conflict emissions, emissions from the war, should I say? Mm -hmm. OK, and with that, um, leave you to think about that. And firstly, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Leonard de Klerk. Leonard is lead author of the Initiative on Greenhouse Gas Accounting of War, which registers the emissions of greenhouse gases caused by Russia's war. He has over 20 years experience in carbon accounting, including projects in Ukraine and the Russian Federation. He's also co-owner of Erota Ecolodge, a sustainable and climate neutral holiday resort in mm -hmm. Northern Hungary. Yeah. Plugged on. Something completely different. Something completely different. <laughs> Over to you. Claire. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed, I'm uh, I'm representing in a group of uh, of uh, carbon experts, and we uh, convened uh, uh, one month after the uh, the start of uh, <clears throat> of uh, Russia's war in in Ukraine um, to to estimate the uh, the impact that this war has on the climate. And of course, the, the 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 primary you know victim of uh, of this act of aggression is uh, is Ukraine and and are the Ukrainians where where the damage is uh, is happening. Um, but we also wanted to show the impact on the on the climate because that uh, through these additional emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, not only the Ukrainians um, uh, you know are a victim of this uh, this act of aggression. But uh, all of us, because we 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 are just uh, <clears throat> have only one climate and uh, one earth. Earth. So, um, moving to uh, the next slide. Want me to share the results of the poll, or yeah, yeah, if you want to show the results of the poll, uh, it doesn't show. Well, <laughs> maybe you can read it out. Yeah. That, so, um, seventy percent um, went for choice three. Yeah, so uh, apparently they people have been reading our reports because that's the uh, that's the uh, the uh, the correct uh, the correct answer. Um, but let me just um, how do I? Doesn't want to. Uh, ah, yeah. Um, so when we actually so so got uh, got started. Um, you know, we we soon realized that this has never been done before. Uh, Axel already uh, showed a, a couple of examples of uh, some calculations that were done in in Iraq's evasion of Kuwait, for example, the Vietnam War, but sort of a an, an whole comprehensive assessment of the emissions of uh, of of a conflict and of of this war um, had uh, never been done before. So when we simply started 
you know, we we um, and we've seen this uh, this before. We uh, had a look at this uh, framework uh, um, proposal by uh, CEOPS. And you know, apart from the the obvious uh, scope one, two, and three, we mainly looked into the scope three plus. These are emissions as a uh, which are related to to conflict. So um, you see a couple of of items uh, like reconstruction uh, fires um, that and and also displacements of uh, of, of people um, that uh, you see them appearing in 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 our report. But in fact, what we are doing, and that maybe sounds a bit 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 weird, but you know, we we consider war as a as a carbon project, um, and in an in a carbon project. So previously, there was JI and CDM. Um, you have the voluntary market, which also consists of uh, carbon projects. There are a couple of things that you 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 have to to establish. First of all, uh, the starting date of a of a project well in this case we we simply took the the full scale inv invasion on the 24th of february 2022 although you could also even argue that this uh, this war started uh, already in 2000 uh, 2014 um the other point is the, the project boundary so basically what kind of uh, sources of emissions do you take into account and which one uh, do you uh, do you ignore and then last but not least baseline versus project emissions so you are setting a baseline meaning what would have been the emissions in a no war scenario so without the the act of aggression and what are the actual war emissions and then the difference uh, that's what you call the additional emissions of, of greenhouse gases so this is let's say a fundamental different approach from doing inventories where you simply take you know absolute emissions or for example a country or of uh, of an of an industry, um, and talking about uh, the project boundary, basically, you we had sort of four four uh, you know major questions that we we needed to answer. First of all, are we going to limit it only to the war theater, or only to uh, Ukraine itself, or are we also going to look on impacts of this war on the missions outside of of uh, of Ukraine? Um, do we only take direct emissions or, for example, indirect emissions? Uh, and indirect emissions, for example, are embodied carbon for the production of ammunition, for example. Um, are we only looking, looking at, at emissions that have happened or are we also uh, you know, looking into future emissions that uh, will occur uh, due, to, to, due to the war? And last but not least, you know, attribution. So things have happened. Um, um, things are changing patterns are changing but this is really because of the war or are there also other non-war related uh, aspects so um actually here and for for those that that um, haven't seen our latest report so this is the total additional emissions of 12 months of uh, of war uh, the total so these are not percentages but these are million tons of co2 equivalent and if you add it all up, it's 119 million ton. And just to give you an idea, this is the same amount what a country in high industrialized country like Belgium emits in 12 months as well. So we are talking about significant uh, emissions. And I just want to go uh, counterclockwise uh, for the different uh, uh, sectors. You know, some of the, the questions and the challenges we are facing in 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 making an accurate uh, accurate estimation, and I will skip uh, the warfare and fires because we will have uh, uh, separate speakers about it. But just to 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 start with the the refugees, um, in the beginning of the uh, of the war, it was fairly easy to 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 estimate you know the movements because we had the UN that was tracking how many um, uh, refugees left the country. Also, Ukraine itself started registering the internal displaced uh, persons. So in the beginning of the war, it was fairly easy to, to estimate, well, you know, most would be by car, some by train. Um, and uh, we even have uh, refugees that went all the way to, to the Americas, for example. So then we would have a mix of car, train and flight, uh, flight emissions. Um, but as the, the war drags on, um, refugees are returning as well, some of them but that's not always taking into account. 
Um, but we're also seeing now um, that a lot of people, uh, women with their children, are going uh, on vacation, actually, to Ukraine to visit their husbands that cannot leave uh, the country. So you also see now a sort of, you know, a regular movement uh, between Ukraine and, uh, and and Europe. And of course, so far, so we, we still will include this element as well. Um, but at some point, we probably have to cut it off because at some point you don't know anymore, you know, what would have been a movement uh, in a no-war situation, in a war situation. Um, and actually, we are also now including the, the, um, the movements of the many Russians that have fled um, uh, their own country because they want to do escape uh, escape the, the draft. Um, then uh, a fairly big one is uh, is Nord Stream, the the act of sabotage. Um, I personally was very surprised when an enormous amount of uh, methane was released by by these three uh, pipelines, and of course the number you see here is in, in converted in CO two equivalent. Um, but this is uh, in terms of uh, attribution. Um, uh, you know, to me, it's clear that this would not have happened in a no war situation. And of course, we 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 did get a question because it's you know the, this Nord Stream is still a big who done it, um, and there are all kind of reports. These are the the Russians, the Americans, uh, the Ukrainians uh, did it, um, but for us, it's not a relevant uh, uh, topic. For us, it's very much would this have 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 had happened in a no war situation and clearly you know this is uh, connected to, to the war um and then the biggest uh, share uh, that you see here the, the the 50 million tons are future emissions so those emissions have not happened yet but they will um happen once uh, the war is over and ukraine needs to be rebuilt and basically these are i would say it's like 70 to 75 percent are uh, the emissions of uh, cement uh, and steel because they are very carbon intensive and the other 25 percent would be the actual construction activities and the other building materials that are using um, but this is really um, i would say also a bit of an eye opener to see that you know this impact on on, on the reconstruction is actually uh, very very significant and i would even uh, think that we we uh, slightly underestimated uh, these emissions, but I'll, I'll come back to that uh, a bit later. Um, now, of course, um, the, the, the war has an impact on the economy as well. And uh, Ukraine's uh, economy shrank about 30% in uh, 2022. But for example, steel production went down a whoppy, whopping 70%. Mm -hmm. So of course you will see uh, the emissions of uh, of Ukraine are going down. Well, we did a, an initial rough calculation, um, and we realized that a lot of these emissions simply went abroad. Those 8 million refugees, they took their emissions to Europe, where they're using transport, where they're heating, where they're consuming products. So um, so simply those, those emissions shifted uh, elsewhere. Steel production, steel is an international market. Uh, Ukraine mainly produces for export. So if Ukraine, you know, demand doesn't change. So if, if, if Ukraine doesn't produce it, someone else will do somewhere else in the world. So the, the reduction of emissions in as a country, at a country level, unfortunately, are no relief to, uh, to, to the climate uh, crisis. Uh, we did look at the uh, at the energy sector in in Europe because we were confronted with an energy crisis, uh, the gas price uh, skyrocketing, and we we saw a dramatic reduction in um, the emissions as a result of natural uh, gas. So that's one uh, you see to 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 the left. Um, but industry, some industries that were able, they switched from gas to uh, to to oil. Um, also, the power sector switched to to uh, to coal-fired plants. Although we um, were expecting actually a bigger sh uh, switch to uh, to coal, and it did happen. Although much of it was attributed to other reasons, uh, it was a very dry uh, year, so there was very low hydropower. Uh, we saw uh, large outages of, uh, of of French nuclear power plants. And mainly the increase of coal um, uh, power production was to, to cover for those two events. So 
here you see also one of the challenges that we're facing. We have to sort of dissect, you know, um, the war impact from other events that are happening at the same uh, at the same time. Um, but in the end of the day, because uh, a lot of pipelined uh, Russian gas was replaced by LNG, and LNG has much higher upstream uh, emissions from the to liquefy it. Um, there is also some um, uh, leakages plus the transport over long distances meant that at the end of the day, uh, we did not see any effect on the emissions in the EU uh, power sector. Um, but same with as refugees, as of course time progresses, it will be much more difficult to, 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 to establish the no war scenario versus the, the actual, uh, actual emissions. Um, now, Sorry, two, two minutes. minutes. Well, um, and of course, it's it's nice to to know the numbers, but uh, in the end of the day, we we also want to make use of uh, of our, of our work. Um, and actually, we're looking now into uh, legal pathways to hold the aggressor accountable for the damage they are doing to the climate climate. And we're looking in in sort of three different uh, ways. First of all. Um, under the Council of Europe, there is this international uh, compensation mechanism set up, which includes an, an, uh, an registry of damages. And uh, we are also advocating now that uh, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions will be part of this uh, registry, because if it's not in the registry, then later on you cannot uh, claim any, any damages. Uh, of course, we have existing courts, although it will the, the lawyers tell me it's very complicated. Uh, we have uh, the International Court of Justice, International Climate uh, Criminal Court. Um, so we'll see uh, what what uh, what they they tell me, but this is unlikely to to be something for the short term, at least. And then, of course, we have the UNFCC. See how uh, you know how we can account or compensate for these uh, these war emissions, because in the end of the day, what we uh, you know want to do is that Russia has caused this problem, but Ukraine can solve it by decarbonizing much quicker than they would under normal scenario. So that's actually what we're interested, not so much in getting money, but solving the climate uh, problem. So in an ideal world, Russia caused it, Ukraine solves it, Russia pays for it. But the third item is uh, is still, uh, still out there. Um, and... Um, so next steps, what we're going to do. So we're now working for COP uh, COP twenty COP twenty eight. Uh, this is the third report covering five hundred fifty days of uh, war, climate, uh, the litigation, which I just mentioned, and we're also looking into the the local. Um, yes, I hear it. Sorry. The local. Uh, <laughs> you know, make sure that those future emissions, well, they will happen, but uh, at a lower level than what we are new now uh, sort of predicting. Um, and more from a research, more a long-term agenda is, you know, improve our methodologies and, and, and align a little bit more with IPCC. Um, but also in the conflict, these emissions, you know, how will they end up in the national registries? And we have Rostislav Boon will be talking a little bit more about, uh, about these aspects. And also then the sort of, they call it burst events or shock events by the IPCC emissions from from large uh, military uh, exercises like the RIMPAC that's going to happen uh, uh, next summer 2024. So here's a link to uh, to uh, our last report for the 12 months and our contact uh, details. Thank you very much. Many well, thanks Leonard and only slightly over. <laughs> well <Okay. done. laughs> Mikola um, will be joining us next online um, and Owen hopefully will do the trick of swapping over but first let me in introduce um Mikola uh, Slapak. Mikola is an environmental consultant from Ukraine working in climate policy, greenhouse gas emissions accounting, climate change mitigation and adaptation as well as on broader topics on environmental and social impact assessments. Mm -hmm. He is a chartered environmentalist and full member of the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, IEMA, and within the Initiative on Greenhouse Gas Accounting of War, he is working on assessing greenhouse gas emissions from warfare activities, as well as the broader impact of the war on countrywide emissions. So thank you very much, um, Nicole, over to you. Uh, th thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Good. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, so uh, while the slides are coming in, uh, I will uh, tell a little bit about our approach to estimating uh, warfare emissions caused by uh, Russia's war in, in Ukraine. Uh, as Leonard mentioned, starting from uh, February uh, last year, uh, from the full-scale uh, invasion. Uh, next, please. Yes, so uh, the fog of war term is uh, uh, like used to reflect the, the uncertainty uh, in situational awareness on the battlefield and during the uh, execution of uh, military operations, but it also could be used to, to reflect the, the uncertainty in accounting of uh, uh, warfare emissions, because there are uh, a number of open uh, questions, like what uh, greenhouse gases emissions to count, what sources are uh, significant and what are uh, less relevant, how to get activity data and uh, what kind of uh, emission uh, factors to use. Uh, as we've uh, learned from previous uh, sessions uh, in, in the morning, there are some uh, estimates about the impact of militaries, but still uh, it's uh, like very early stages of research uh, in this uh, topic and associated with uh, like very limited data availability. Uh, that's why it's like complicated to, to approach calculations. Uh, but uh, on the next slide, uh, I will briefly tell you how we uh, approach this challenge. Uh, so first of all, uh, we uh, use the step-by-step uh, -step approach. And first, we uh, focused uh, on key sources uh, of emissions uh, and then gradually tried to extend both the uh, like scope of uh, emissions accounted uh, and also the depths, the details of, of uh, accounting. Uh, the, the very first estimates uh, of uh, greenhouse gases emissions associated with this war were made even before the uh, start of the war in February uh, 2022 uh, by Ukrainian consulting company KT Energy. And it was focused on like emissions associated with the preparatory activities and building uh, up forces on the borders uh, of Ukraine. Uh, then within our initiative, the, the first uh, report has been presented at COP27 last year and the second update in June this year. And within each uh, uh, report, within each iteration, we tried to uh, extend the scope and uh, depths uh, of uh, calculations. Uh, second important uh, uh, point is that uh, it's very important to uh, like match different expertise uh, and from different fields and, and sectors. And here uh, it uh, refers to both like military expertise, uh, emission accounting expertise, and, but also uh, other specific uh, topics and uh, we've benefited a lot from the work of uh, scientists uh, including uh, those who presented uh, earlier today because we've used the findings of the research for instance on the uh, environmental uh, life cycle environmental impact of the uh, ammunition of the shells used by uh, artillery uh, also, uh, we used uh, the approaches similar to uh, approaches on estimated carbon footprint of uh, uh, military equipment, uh, uh, like we've had for, for Norway, uh, but also uh, many other research papers on, on, on the topic. Uh, also, like open source intelligence community uh, provides like valuable insights into the uh, different uh, questions, including uh, like 
tracking the number of different equipment damaged or destroyed during the war, and also, for instance, uh, fortification, uh, construction of fortifications on, on, on the uh, front line. And uh, with respect to uh, accuracy, accuracy is like treated as one of the core principles in carbon accounting in like project based level or while uh, calculating carbon footprint of companies. Uh, but in case of uh, uh, warfare emissions, uh, we uh, probably need to sacrifice the accuracy at the first uh, steps of accounting and try to uh, focus on uh, key sources to understand the scale and structure of emissions and then uh, to try to improve uh, the accuracy uh, within the next iterations. Uh, next slide, please. So basically this slide you've seen uh, in Lennar's presentations, but uh, warfare emissions uh, counts, uh, like represents about almost 20% of overall uh, climate damage, and if you looked uh, on the structure of warfare emissions on the next slide, uh, then basically uh, the key uh, uh, source of uh, emissions calculated is emission are emissions uh, associated with uh, fuel consumption. Uh, it's uh, the the main share, but uh, other sources included in our calculations. Uh, in, in our uh, use of uh, ammunition, uh, use and manufacturing of ammunition, uh, military equipment, and also uh, construction of uh, uh, fortifications. And just a little bit uh, in more details on each of these uh, source. Uh, next, please. So fuel, it's almost 19 million tons of uh, CO2 uh, equivalent and uh, uh, from the like previous summer session, previous uh, uh, conflicts and uh, uh, overall fuel consumption by militaries, uh, we understood that uh, the structure of fuel consumption uh, could, could be different and depends on the nature of, uh, of the war. And uh, if in, in some cases aviation is the key uh, source of uh, emissions, uh, but in, in case of Ukrainian war, aviation was used to a limited extent and uh, ground-based equipment was responsible for uh, the largest share of emissions. Uh, there is no reliable data on fuel consumption during the, the war, and we uh, approach this uh, by using uh, different uh, methodologies, different approaches to estimate. Uh, using the uh, research uh, like two bottom up approach based on uh, some publications on fuel supply uh, by ra railway to the regions bordering Ukraine and also by the uh, estimates for fu on fuel consumption per uh, one soldier in previous uh, wars and conflicts and the bottom up approach was used to just check the reasonability of estimates that, that we've uh, arrived at. Next, please. And one of the important findings what was that uh, emissions of uh, so-called logistical uh, tail uh, could be uh, several times higher than emissions from uh, the fighting tools. So basically, uh, though uh, tanks and aircrafts are probably uh, the most visible consumers of fuel during the war, uh, behind the front lines operates like huge uh, machine that uh, supply uh, different goods, uh, equipment and soldiers uh, to the battlefield. And this uh, uh, machine consume huge uh, volumes uh, of uh, energy and cause significant emissions. And this also means that uh, significant emissions occurs uh, even during the periods when uh, the front lines are more or less stable or there is no uh, significant developments on the front lines. Next, please. Uh, so ammunition was responsible uh, for about 2 million tons of uh, 
emissions and we uh, here we use the life cycle approach uh, as i said using the uh, uh, research uh, on uh, environmental impact of uh, ammunition and the the uh, lion's share of emissions are associated uh, with the manufacturing of uh, ammunition and explosions there are some emissions during uh, detonation and combustion of propellant, but it's not uh, very significant compared to manufacturing emissions. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so almost 98% occur during uh, manufacturing and only a small fraction uh, occurs during the use uh, phase. Next, please. Uh, fortifications, although it's like uh, quite uh, significant uh, length, so, uh, several uh, thousands of kilometers of uh, trench lines uh, were uh, cons constructed uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, but in terms of emissions uh, uh, and like several hundreds of kilometers of uh, so-called Dragon Teeth uh, fortifications uh, were also uh, constructed, but in terms of uh, emissions, it's uh, not uh, very significant and in latest report amounted for 0 0.1 million tons of CO2 uh, equivalent. Next, please. And the last uh, uh, source of emissions is uh, manufacturing of uh, military equipment. Uh, as it was mentioned, there is uh, uh, like huge amounts of steel and other uh, materials used to for the manufacturing of uh, military equipment and machinery, but there is very limited research uh, on carbon footprint uh, uh, of of such uh, if equipment, and we uh, used the proxy estimates from uh, civil machinery uh, and equipment, which is like very conservative approach because. Uh, it's uh, military equipment requires like more uh, carbon intensive uh, manufacturing process and different types of uh, materials, but it's amounted for almost 1 million tons uh, of CO2 equivalent. Next, please. So basically the, the key takeaways is that warfare emissions are very significant and only uh, a fraction of them occurs on, on, on the battlefield, while supply chain emissions could be uh, two to five times higher than uh, operational emissions on the military. And uh, significant emissions occur uh, during manufacturing of uh, munition, ammunition and explosives, uh, during manufacturing of military equipment and machinery, and also uh, from the consumption of fuel uh, by uh, military logistical uh, systems. Uh, next, please. Yeah, and uh, it's a sad reminder that uh, the like largest cost of war is the human lives uh, toll. Uh, Oleksiy was probably one of the brightest mind in energy and climate uh, related uh, air in Ukraine. Uh, he devoted many years of his life uh, to building climate policy, energy policy uh, in Ukraine. Uh, he joined armed forces uh, at the beginning of the war and unfortunately was killed in action this year in May near Bakhmut. Uh, but he will be always remembered in the hearts, not only of his family and closest people, uh, but also in the hearts of everyone who worked and learned from, from Alexei. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, you very much um, Nicola, and for the very sobering um, tribute to the end, at the end as well. Um, and thank you also for keeping spot on time. Um, so next, um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Sahi Zipsev, is a professor at the Department of Civil Culture of the National University of Life and Environmental Sciences of Ukraine in Kyiv. 
He is also head of the regional Eastern Europe Fire Monitoring Centre, affiliated with the Global Fire Centre. Since the start of the war on the 24th of February, the Fire Centre monitors the area of every single landscape fire in Ukraine and publishes results that provide the background for carbon emission assessment. Um, so he, thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I represent Regional Eastern Europe Fire Monitoring Centre, and uh, this work is a joint uh, efforts of uh, of uh, Zoe International, Nikolai Denisov, and group of uh, researchers from our university, but also from uh, Ukrainian Institute of Forestry, which is located in Kharkiv. And uh, we are more working with fires and uh, all, all kind of uh, types of fires, but uh, we have group who working with GIS and also with carbon. And this group, uh, led by Petro Lakida, and rooted in the ASA in Luxembourg with Anatoly Shvedenka. So, <clears throat> yes, this is uh, our joint efforts. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, the difference uh, between previous uh, topics and, and uh, this topic is that uh, the carbon emission from fires there could uh, could be one hour two hours or or they can uh, uh, emit uh, during years or even decades you see in the left uh, bottom picture this is a pine forest heavily damaged by fire and this is a will be long story long emissions in the in our calculations we just uh, calculate immediate uh, emissions so immediately after fire but uh, next step maybe together with leonard uh, uh, we, we try to make estimation of long uh, uh, all, all, all cycle of emissions next please and uh, I need to say that uh, we started to, to work with, next slide, we started to work with this uh, earlier in 2014 and 15 in, uh, in uh, military polygons and uh, in uh, near Disna city, near Kyiv. And uh, actually we recognized that the tank movement, the Soviet tanks, they, 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 uh, permanently ignited everything because they have no spark uh, control in their uh, in their engines and so all kind of uh, impact including shelling including phosphorus bomb including just uh, like Mikola mentioned uh, logistics they are sources of uh, ignition and uh, recently I see that around 400, more than 400,000 of people uh, located in uh, Russian military is located in Ukraine. And of course, uh, it's not only shellings, but also their uh, uh, burning of garbage and uh, other stuff, they, they all uh, damaged, uh, ignited forest. And also important uh, things uh, in terms of uh, duration of emissions that that most of uh, pine forest from Kharkiv to Kherson this uh, along the river Seversky Donets and uh, in Kherson Oblast they are damaged like you can see on the right uh, picture so this is a pine so it's not it's not uh, will be this resprouting and so we expect this uh, dieback huge dieback and then Slowly, it's not directly related with fires, but it will contribute to, to carbon emissions. And in current uh, reports and uh, presentation, is I think is gap because uh, nobody is thinking about uh, this uh, mechanical damage from shedding. And soon, I think uh, Maxim Matsala and uh, co-authors will publish uh, estimation of uh, area of forest that uh, mechanically damaged to, to the level that uh, they could not uh, 
uh, live longer. Please, next slide. Next slide. Yes, so our data is, uh, we published them on the site of the Regional Eastern Europe Fire Monitoring Center. You can find their uh, advisory fire, fire bulletin and then uh, those maps, uh, we publish them every month. And uh, you can see the picture from 2022, this accumulative, uh, accumulative picture of fires. And uh, yeah, <laughs> actually Ukraine is a known source of uh, emissions from, uh, from agriculture, from fires, from agriculture fires. And you see on the Carpathian, where not uh, military impact, you see a lot of fires. But of course, main sources is uh, Kiev Oblast, Chernigov Oblast, uh, Kharkiv, Lugansk, and Kherson. And uh, it's going on. Next, please. Yeah, so this is a shortly uh, methodology. Of course, uh, we can we quite precisely uh, build the I mean draw fire perimeters. It it, it published on Zenodo uh, web resource. It's open for download, and uh, this is a methodology. We use Sentinel to uh, imagery, and then uh, we <clears throat> uh, use uh, Copernicus uh, dynamic uh, land cover. And then we made assessment of every fire with a DNBR, normalized burn uh, ratio approach, which is uh, allow us to, to classify it on a low uh, intensity and uh, high intensity fires, which is, uh, of course, directly impact uh, carbon emission. And then we use highest uh, highest uh, highest uh, meaning of uh, dnbr after within 40 days period after every every fire and then so we have a type of biomass uh, intensity of burning and then it's directly bring us to the calculation of carbon next please and then uh, we divided all uh, landscapes. We are not talking about forest fires, about landscape fire, which is a forest fire, which is a uh, cultivated lands fire, which is a grasslands fire, which is a uh, abundant uh, lands and uh, so and grasslands. So for for forest, uh, we have this very good data. Uh, of group led by Petro Lakida for all uh, all species, and we have a good Soviet style forest inventory data, and so this allow us to understand what uh, species, what age, uh, what is the biomass was on a on a fire on it was burned, but uh, the biggest. Uh, problems that we struggled and that of course impacted the results is a lack of uh, field data on uh, on level of uh, burning. So we use more expert assessment based on a Chernobyl fire on 2020, where it was burned around 80,000 hectares during months. So we, we have this uh, estimation, but of course, uh, we would be happy to to do field research and to 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 provide to get the support for field research and then in this case quality of assessment and uh, uncertainties could be reduced. Next, please. Yes, for croplands and grasslands, it's uh, less precise assessment because it's more on, based on statistical data. And uh, on statistic of uh, agriculture, of course, statistic is not also good because it's very dynamic process. And farmers, many farmers lost their harvest and many farmers uh, uh, harvest grains. But uh, anyway, we try to uh, calculate this as well. 
And also we divided all, all fires on uh, three zones, zone that controlled by government of Ukraine, war zone, which is uh, we, which we get from uh, Zoe International. Thank you to them. This is a 60, 60 kilometer zone along the along the <clears throat> front line, and then occupied territory. So we we have uh, this kind of assessment. Next, please. This is actually results. Uh, I must say that in 2022 was very safe year. A lot of precipitation, no uh, no extreme fire weather events. Usually, Ukraine can the area of uh, agriculture burning in Ukraine can reach three four millions, like in 2017 2018. We have a paper on on that with the uh, University of of uh, Maryland. So in 2022, we have a uh, like 400,000 uh, uh, fires of cropland burned and uh, 31,000 of uh, conifer forest, 25,000 of hectares of uh, other forest and. Uh, uh, other grasslands is at uh, 273,000 hectares. So main contribution was from cropland and other vegetation from point of view of area, but in terms of uh, biomass uh, loss, of course, forest is very important. In the long-term period, they will contribute more and more. And uh, as a result, we have uh, in our assessment, this is a during 31st of December 22, 5 million ton of uh, CO2 equivalent and uh, another 0 0.2 is other greenhouse emissions. But I thought that uh, maybe our uh, estimation could be improved uh, if we will get statistically filled, uh, filled research, maybe next year, and then quite precisely assessment uh, amount of uh, biomass that, that burned during different DNBR uh, indica indicators. Next, please. So, um, uh, yes, we, 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 we found that uh, actually the Clerk report is the most uh, most advanced in compare with uh, not many groups or or scientists uh, try to to do assessment. So uh, good analysis we found in political article, <laughs> and uh, we need to improve our burnt factor coefficient understanding on the safe territories in the western Ukraine. We can do it. Of course, we could not uh, visit uh, eastern eastern part of uh, eastern fires, and the problem of fires that uh, they are, they can continue it in in normal life in our war, they usually they are addressed within within one two three hours, and the maximum they can burn one week, or like in Chernobyl one month, but that was extreme case. In case of uh, war fires, they're burning unless they burn all biomass. And uh, this is it depends on weather. And also specific feature of uh, fires during war that these phosphorus bombs, for example, the 1,200 degrees of Celsius, which is a higher than uh, most uh, intensive fire, even crown fire. So they ignite even wet biomass, but this biomass is not uh, is not uh, burning very long time. But this is additional factors that, uh, of course, we could not uh, could not uh, take into account. So yeah, next slide. Yeah, as a conclusion, uh, we 
would like to say that uh, yes, croplands is a, the weakest point of our landscapes before the war. Like you see, even during the war, farmers very often burn them to clean residues uh, from the fields. And uh, for the moment, I can say that uh, we started to do preliminary analysis due to territorial abarona, uh, territorial defense forces all over Ukraine. They are staying on all highways, on all streets. On, uh, so the, the illegal burning, burning of uh, res residuals is illegal in Ukraine. So illegal burning uh, reduced, and uh, we hope to get the uh, latest data on controlled by government territory on agriculture lands for 2022. Uh, to see dynamic of uh, this, the paradox will be that uh, carbon emissions from ignited uh, intense, intense, intentional burning that they could uh, could reduce. Yeah, next slide. I think it's the last one. Yes, next slide. <clears throat> yes, so thank you for your attention. Uh, many thank you. Uh, many thanks, Sahi. Um, yeah, lots of probably discussion about different techniques with respect to estimating for forest fires and mm -hmm. landscape fires to be had there as well. Um, so next, um, another online, we have Rostislav Bun. Rostislav is a professor at Lviv Polytechnic National University in Ukraine and a professor at the WSB University in Poland. He is the author of many publications on spatial analysis of greenhouse gases in different sectors and on uncertainty analysis. Thank you very much, Rostislav. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present these results on tracking unaccounted, unreported uh, emissions due to the war in Ukraine. I would like to present slightly different view on the war-related emissions. I will focus on war-related emissions, and this is not the same as military emissions. And I will see this problem from the point of view of international reporting. Next, next slide, please. Uh, the various rankings of uh, GEG emissions by countries are well known. They show for what share of global emissions each country is responsible. Uh, they provide an opportunity to analyze the dynamics of changes, the impact of uh, mitigation efforts. You can see here the position of Russia and Ukraine in these rankings. We have this data, we know this data because scientists and uh, policymakers have invested huge efforts to develop and implement the reporting system on GHG emissions. Next slide, please. Uh, accounting and reporting greenhouse gas emissions are mandatory for parties under the Paris Agreement. Uh, this reporting uh, to the UNFCCC is important for understanding the global carbon cycle, for elaboration of mitigation efforts, etc. We know IPCC guidelines, which cover many, many sectors and categories of human activity. We know uh, the common reporting format to unify submissions to the UNCC. But very important here is uh, the during, uh, during Gulf War, Kuwait 
destroyed and ignited Kuwait, uh, Iraq destroyed and ignited Kuwait oil fields. And there were huge emissions of greenhouse gases from oil fires. The scientists from Carbon Dioxide Information Analysis Center CDA, estimated the total emission for that year, but it was uh, not clear to which country attribute uh, them, because emissions from, was, were from Kuwait territory, but Kuwait was not responsible for these emissions. Uh, the author teams, uh, especially Professor Borden and Professor Greg Marland, were very creative and they created a new country, new country, Kuwait oil fires. This is still showing in global and national emission data, such a one year country code. Uh, these military related emissions were largest during the Kyoto Protocol period. The second example, in uh, 2014, three Ukrainian provinces were occupied by Russia. Two provinces are very industrialized, iron and steel production, mining, etc. The total area of this uh, occupied territory is like the Netherlands area. For eight years, Ukrainian government had not any data uh, for activity data uh, from this occupied territory. But as Annex One country, Ukrainian submitted uh, national inventory reports every year. In this report, is uh, uh, written that an expert estimation was used for these territories. For territories like the Netherlands, an expert estimate was used for all activities, all sectors, all categories of human activity. What is an uncertainty of these estimates? And uh, it was not other options. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. From February 2022, we have a full-scale war. Uh, more than 3,000 settlements were occupied. We have analyzed and classified emissions that will not be covered by national inventory reporting. Even if a small, small part of this emission will be reported in, the, in any way, uh, they will be reported in very non-transparent way and with high uncertainty. Next slide, please. The first emission from the use of bomb, missiles, barrel artillery, drones, mines, etc. Both from two sides. Uh, here is an estimate for 18 months of the war. The atmosphere received this emission from the territory of Ukraine. According to the principle of reporting, these emissions should be reported by Ukraine. But uh, there is no such option in IPCC guideline. And what is more, Ukrainian is uh, not responsible for these emissions. Certainly, the activity data and emission factors for such estimates are not available uh, officially. Uh, we use uh, data uh, publicly av available from news, from reports, uh, where needed from scientists, expert estimates from scientists from Lviv State University of Life Safety. Uh, the second, emissions from the use of petroleum products uh, for military actions. The front line was about 2,000 kilometers. Many thousands of tanks, planes, helicopters, other vehicles took part. Uh, and during 18 months, uh, they used a huge amount of petroleum products. 
uh, this is estimate for 18 months. This estimate does not include emissions from transport of volunteers, tra emission from transportation of uh, uh, equipment of partners through territory of Ukraine, emission from uh, small power generators during uh, uh, blackouts, uh, because uh, this fuel uh, will uh, be uh, uh, accounted in national uh, statistics and will be reported in a future national inventory report. Next slide, please. Emission from fires from petroleum products at petroleum storage depots. All biggest petroleum storage depots in Ukraine were destroyed uh, by missile attack both in, on the occupied territory as well as on the not occupied territory. At each such deport, the fire lasted several days and burned thousands of tons of petroleum products. Uh, what is more, the main oil refiners were destroyed, uh, many petroleum stations, many petrol trucks. There is no option to report these emissions, and Ukraine is not responsible for these emissions. Uh, the force, more than 3,000 settlements were occupied. And as a result of military actions, many buildings were completely burned, and greenhouse gases were emitted into the atmosphere. In each household, there are wooden construction and sinks, such as floor, windows, door, furniture, roof construction. There are many uh, other uh, combustible material in each household, like plastics, uh, fabrics, clothes, books, etc. An estimation is presented here. Uh, I uh, can say that I received one strange uh, feedback from one of a reviewer that we cannot uh, consider uh, emissions from burning uh, wooden construction, uh, biomass, together with emission from petroleum products, for example, because uh, wood uh, biomass is from existing uh, carbon cycle, and uh, if forests are managed sustainably, there are not any additional emissions. But uh, during the war, war is unsustainable human activity. This was burning uh, not for heating, not for uh, uh, energy production. It was heating useless. And what is more, new, new wood uh, will be needed for reconstruction of these houses and uh, infrastructure objects. Next slide, please. Emissions from forest fire and fire of agricultural lands. Yes, the military actions caused large-scale forest fire, which could not be extinguished due to the canonite, to mines. The same with forest, uh, with fires of agricultural land in the South Ukrainian, because we already had two seasons of harvesting uh, here. Sergei Zipsev already presented these fires in uh, very details before me. Uh, certainly he and uh, his uh, teams are strong experts here. Maybe these data on my slide are slightly overestimated comparing to Sergei's data, but I think our uncertainty ranges uh, overlap. But uh, very important here is that this is not controlled burning of uh, forest. This is not wildfires, as uh, IPCC guidelines suggest. And uh, Ukraine is not responsible for this burning of forest. Uh, emission from garbage waste. Many houses and infrastructure objects were destroyed by blast waves. 
or damaged by military vehicles, uh, wooden construction, windows, door, furniture, household items, uh, uh, fancy, etc. Many trees were cut down to use the wood to build trenches and other shelters. This material was not burned. It became waste, but not waste in IPCC guidelines understanding, like solid waste disposal, managed waste disposal, composting, etc. One example from our university. Uh, the dormitories of our university, our campus, uh, was uh, near the epicenter of the missile attack in July this year. According to the information of our rector, during this attack, were damaged by blast waves in our dormitories 1,100 windows, 300 doors as well as roof construction, only in our university. Uh, they were not burned, they were became waste. Next slide, please. Here is a summary table of our esti estimate. These emissions were originated from the territory of Ukraine. According to principle of IPCC reporting, they should be uh, reported by Ukraine. But these emissions were caused by aggressor. Ukrainian have not any data from aggressor. And uh, uh, it, it cannot be uh, reported in national inventory report. Even if small, small part of these emissions will be reported in any way, uh, fossil fuel, etc., it will be reported in very non-transparent way and with high uncertainty. To understand the scale of these emissions, I can say that uh, it is uh, an order of uh, uh, total JG emission of Austria, Portugal, or Hungary. Some People who are not familiar with specifics of current war uh, can say that IPCC guidelines are flexible in each sector is a category like uh, other, please specify. And you can report this emission in these other categories. But this is emission caused by action of aggressor. Ukrainian is not responsible for this emissions to be reported. Next slide, please. This is a summary illustration. The current war fundamentally changed the structure and amount of emission in all sectors of human activity in Ukraine. In particular, uh, emissions decreasing in many traditional sector like iron and steel production, public electricity and heat production, road transportation, chemical industry, shipping, aviation, etc. According to our estimate, a reduction in total pre-war emissions during the 18 months of the war to be 156 megaton CO2 equivalent. But this activity, these changes, goes through statistical reporting and will be therefore reported in national inventory reports. This reduction, this reduction did not uh, occur as a result of appropriate uh, mitigation efforts, but it was associated with colossal destruction and human suffering. Globally, a significant part of these uh, reduced emissions has been transferred to other countries via footprint of refugees, uh, via re the re reallocation of iron and steel production, and other. And uh, therefore will be reported in national inventory report of these other countries. Here I focus on 
right part of this slide on war-related emissions that are not covered by national reporting. Scientists and policymakers are working to reduce emission, to understand the magnitude of emission, to reduce uh, the uncertainty. But a war can suddenly override years of these positive uh, efforts. It uh, turned off that the international reporting system on GG emissions is not ready to current war-related challenges. The accounting emissions the, and the responsibility for these emissions uh, remain an ongoing challenge for scientists and uh, policymakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rostislav. Um, I didn't want to stop you there because you obviously had so many important points to say. Um, we had gone a little bit over, but we've still got um, enough time, I think, left for questions at, at the end. Um, but next, I would like to um, very please introduce Ladan. Ladan Abrari is the is a junior researcher and doctoral student in sustainability science at Lott University in Finland. Her research focuses on the environmental footprint of war, encompassing greenhouse gas emissions, transitions, and social metabolism, societal metabolism, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ladan. Um, uh, um... Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. Actually, we are in very early stage of um, our research, but uh, I'm pleased that today I uh, present our research objectives, methodology, and uh, some results we have investigated so far. And the Second World War is recognized as the most destructive conflict in history. It can encompass economic, social, and cultural dimension. It engulfed uh, 1.7 uh, million pe billion people, uh, and also it has um, about 75 million uh, uh, casualties and equivalent of 3% of the population at that time. Uh, in addition, there were injured a uh, hundred of millions of people and innumerable uh, other living creatures. The World War cost of World War II is estimated about uh, one trillion dollar and make it it in the most uh, expensive war uh, by far. It also has uh, heavily destroyed the environment as well. Uh, in our ambitious research project, we are estimating the share of uh, World War II in uh, increased net CO2 emission and, and their contribution to accelerating global warming and uh, climate change. And the graph shows a uh, schematic of expected carbon footprint result for the uh, World War II um, timeframe window. We are estimating the total carbon uh, emission based on emission sources. Uh, we divide the emission sources to a combustion of fuels, a bombing, fire, smoke, a manufacturing and production uh, of fire, and material and energy consumption for adaptation and resilience, see <clears throat> heating and cooling, and um, that they affected CO2 emission in war directly or indirectly. Uh, also, we, as, we estimate the overall carbon footprint of uh, World War II by in the, um, integrating of uh, footprint of major one, war events uh, and also the history of war-related emissions uh, during and after war, using both a chronologic and event-based analysis that allow us to distinguish to a uh, contribution of uh, major war events such as uh, bombing of Hiroshima, Battle of Stalingrad, and so on to uh, the overall uh, World War II CO2 emission. Not only we should consider uh, the war events, but uh, because all the war and events has uh, some preparation phase and also uh, post-war 
um, post period for resiliency, we should also consider them in our um, estimation. We also, as others, use a bottom up uh, approach uh, in which information on the history of World War II military um, resources of material and energy demands and municipal and industrial, civil and social aspect will be used to estimate the uh, carbon footprint. Uh, after completion, the research, we expect to see some outcomes. Uh, we also have some uh, speculation. Uh, in addition to assess the carbon footprint and um, its impact to um, um, accelerating climate change and uh, global warming, our environmental impacts can be estimated um, from our um, result uh, and uh, data. Uh, for example, uh, um, air pollutant, water footprint, um, black carbon that is uh, caused by melting ice, and uh, waste production, uh, biodiversity and uh, deforestation, uh, waste heat can be also uh, distract from the result. Aside from destructive environmental impact of uh, conflicts, historical in, uh, evidence shows that uh, wars play an important role in um, social technical transition, technological uh, evolution and trajectory. Uh, this ongoing Russia conflict, uh, uh, Russia Ukraine um, conflict, for instance, demonstrate the that the uh, disruption in um, uh, in the natural gas supply um, uh, um, uh, motivated the policymaker to facilitate a renewable energy uh, for EU countries. Um, the result will help to understand the transition dynamic uh, in resource depletion, manufacturing, and energy consumption as a different impact of war. Uh, also, we should be surprised, uh, prepared to be surprised with new knowledge that uh, the, um, car the carbon emission from the most destructive uh, conflict in the war can be also uh, uh, comparable with our current unsustainable activities uh, and some key emission occurring now in countries, companies, process, or activities. Such comparison with aim to be uh, compared to those from uh, World War II as a meaningful uh, reference value. Um, because of the World War II stigma as a devastating global conflict, our finding can help with the societal impacts of uh, GAG and uh, their effect on global warming and uh, climate change. For, for example, uh, saying that uh, the transportation uh, sector features uh, a carbon footprint equal to X percent of World War II or X percent of Hiroshima uh, conflict uh, probably convey more uh, societal impact um, than saying that uh, that's, that sector has uh, this amount of um, CO2 emission. Uh, finally, we uh, also carry political uh, implication that can help policymaker. The year 2050 is the IPCC deadline to limit the global warming uh, effect by 1.5 centigrade. Uh, and we hope that um, these analytical studies like ours can help and provide a quantitative uh, framework for managing the share of carbon cap capture for the countries engaged in past and uh, current and future work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in this uh, step, we are looking uh, into carbon uh, footprint or uh, originating from transportation, fuels, and energy production. 
First, looking at the annual uh, CO2 emission by key countries before, during, and after uh, the war help us to understanding this historical pattern. Uh, during World War II, there was a significant rise in uh, greenhouse gas emission due, uh, uh, due to a large scale industrial activities for military production, change in agricultural practice, and widespread bombing. World War II seems to be a turning point for countries like Germany, Italy, and U.S. in increasing uh, GHG emission. Uh, from 1935 to 1960, uh, global uh, CO2 emission surged by about 150% uh, influenced uh, by industrialization and World War II. Um, Uh, also, there was a substantial increase in industrial production to meet the demand for military equipment, vehicle, and weaponry. Uh, this production rely on fossil fuel, leading to a surge in CO2 emissions. Oil and gas um, CO2 emission grew at a much faster pace than coal, indicating a global transition toward uh, these energy sources. Uh, the impact of World War II on this emission was significant, particularly for coal, uh, coal and oil, and uh, due to their expensive, extensive use in the war. Uh, at currently, we are uh, we have found some uh, data related to war effort uh, uh, fuel consumption uh, in Germany. During World War II, Germany experienced a significant increase in CO2 emission due to a heightened fuel consumption for military and industrial activities. Coal as the major uh, contributor with emission consistently uh, rising to uh, 700 million tons in 1943, and the total was about uh, 3,000 million tons. Uh, underscore its role as a primary uh, energy source. Um, actually, uh, yeah. if from military point of view, Germany experienced uh, substantial fluctuation in uh, CO2 emission from oil driven uh, by um, intensified military activities and external disruption. Uh, a closer look at the data reveals that um, more than 70% of CO2 emission originated from fuel consumption was attributed to military uh, transportation uh, and underlining the military's dominant role in uh, oil consumption. Uh, this, the significant decline in 1945 uh, shows the um, after the war that uh, it has decreased. Uh, also, um, the data from, uh, some data from uh, war effort in USA, uh, USA experienced an uh, increase in CO2 emission from uh, military transportation fuel by about uh, 75 million tons uh, and almost 30% uh, of the uh, oil consumption uh, was attributed to a military and uh, during war. For other countries, since uh, we have not found reliable war effort data yet, the analysis is based on hypothetical uh, scenarios and a rough estimation for of the share of CO2 emission from military fuel consumption uh, to total CO2 emission. Uh, and thus there might be an accuracy in that. And uh, generally, Japan's uh, military had the highest uh, share, about 80 percent, uh, and uh, China had the smallest share, about uh, 5 percent. Uh, other uh, countries like USSR, UK, France, and Italy had about uh, 30 percent share in uh, military. Uh, Despite the potential inaccuracy uh, in this picture, this estimate provide a generalized overview of each country's military contribution to uh, CO2 emission from field during World War II. 
We also have some studies related to the role of World War II in societal met uh, metabolism and also socio-technical and socio-economic transition, particularly addressing um, the post-war great acceleration. Uh, it had profound uh, socio-economic, technological, and environmental implications catalyzed, uh, catalyzed uh, extensive global transition with enduring uh, consequences. The war led to demographic shift characterized by a significant increase in birth rate, uh, resulting in heightened demand for resources and accelerated urbanization. It fostered paradoxical economic growth and post war uh, uh, prosperity with government policies such as New Deal and Marshall Plan and that they playing uh, pivotal roles. Significant technology advancement uh, during this era revolutionized industries and laid the foundation for today's tech century. Uh, tech centric board. Uh, additionally, a surge in industrial production and energy consumption resulted in resource depletion, and increased CO2 emission, and heightened environmental consciousness. Uh, and it said, uh, in a scale of World War II and across multiple nations and uh, territories inherently suffers from challenges uh, and uh, demand multidisciplinary approach. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I think um, the important thing uh, is finding data. Uh, we have very challenging <laughs> and uh, we suffer from uh, finding reliable data. Um, also, for um, also, um, the uh, beginning and end point of World War II are uh, fuzzy. No one knows exactly uh, when the first shots of World War II were fired. For example, uh, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931 is uh, beginning to be more acceptable as a true start of conflict. Moreover, the Cold War and its environmental consequences may be well. Uh, related to World War II. Uh, furthermore, the resiliency boundary is also fuzzy. Uh, for example, we do not exactly when the uh, construction of uh, buildings and city has ended after Hiroshima and the end point that we do not need to estimate the carbon footprint after that. Additionally, there are biases and no, no information for which engineering history uh, will be combined with the historical fact about World War II, uh, estimating emission due to fire, uh, smoke types, uh, combusted material, and destruction in each event are also subject to uncertainties. Uh, there are societal factors that we do we are not prepared to analyze. For example, we cannot quantify the uh, equivalent CO two emission uh, due to premature death, uh, disability, disposition, and mental health consequences at a global scale. There were many talents and um, disposition that were uh, involved in the war, and they had to participate in war uh, while uh, they could be efficient in helping science and development of the society. Accordingly, the overall efficiency of society has increased, ha has decreased. Uh, I am here and, and present on behalf of our wonderful research team. <laughs> and uh, war leaves enduring scars on both humanity and our precious planet with impacts that extend far beyond numbers and figures. Let's strive toward a world where battlefields transformed into field of green, fostering seed of peace for our shared planet, where both nature and humanity can flourish and shadow by a strife. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Ladin, and, and thank, thank you. you as well for reminding us about the um, social impacts of conflict as well. We are focusing on environmental ones, but it's important to obviously remember those as well. Uh, okay, um, so we've got, I'm afraid, just um, about 13 minutes left for some questions, um, unfortunately, but um, obviously the debate doesn't end here or now or today, and just encourage everyone to exchange um, um contact details, et cetera. And um, Axel, I think you have the first question. 
Yeah, I have two questions. I have one question to Leonard and uh, Rostislav. So, of course, you've both been doing estimates. They differ. Uh, apparently, Rostislav's uh, estimates are lower. Rostislav, would you have any view on why your estimates are lower than those of Leonard's team? And my question to Ladan would be, do you have any, any initial estimate on the emissions? You showed a lot of different sources, but you didn't come up with a conclusion. <laughs> we, I'm going to take questions one at a time so I can actually remember them. <laughs> <laughs> and I will come to you next. Um, my question would be, uh, whose responsibility should it be to monitor emissions during conflicts? And related to that, do you foresee a time when there is a standard methodology or is there so much variety between conflicts and countries that that would be impossible? Okay, let's take a, um, Leonard, you're the easiest first because you're in the room, perhaps to go about the first point that uh, Axel asked about the difference well, in data. Well, yeah, it was to me or to, to Rossislav? Well, or... maybe if, uh, if yeah. you have any views on it. No, uh, so for example, um, what uh, Rossislav have done is only related to emissions on the t from the territory of U Ukraine, and we have uh, taken a broader, uh, broader perspective. So that, for example, uh, explains uh, why you you do see uh, do see the different numbers. Yep. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, if you say about uh, country borders, yes, uh, we uh, uh, also can uh, distinguish emissions that uh, will be reported and emissions that will not be reported. I uh, uh, pay attention to not reported because production munition, for example, in a Leonard uh, study, Yes, but I can not see this emission because it goes through national statistics. Thank you. Um, while we're just on the Q&A session, I can just also introduce Nikolai, who's been working very closely with Sahi, and I think you're available as well to answer any questions, Nikolai, if they come up. Um, so I wondered if... if um, Anyone, um, Ladin, the comment about um, your, kind of, I know you're in your early days of your research, but respect yeah. to any um, estimates to date. Yeah, actually, as I mentioned, <laughs> we are in very early stage of our research because of that, we have uh, not many results yet. Um, <laughs> and we have started with transition uh, that affected by World War II. And about uh, the data, uh, the data show in uh, Germany and US are that I showed uh, there are the CO2 emission that we uh, estimated uh, related to fuel consumption and military uh, fuel consumption that uh, we found from that. Um, and I um, mentioned about that, that uh, uh, for Germany, uh, military, uh, CO2 emission from uh, military fuel consumption was about uh, 3,000 million tons. And uh, also uh, for USA, it was about 1,400 million tons. And that is what we have found yet. <laughs> and uh, uh, we need more data for other countries that uh, we can complete it. And have you been looking at um, historic extraction data or you know how how critical how have you found that data sets respect to um, yeah actually it is um, the hardest part of yeah. <laughs> our research because um, um i'm i'm not remember well that uh, who was mentioned that in uh, russia you can see in russia and uh, ukraine war that it is currently uh, happen it is very hard to record data and data collection uh, and um, and um, now you can see that the uh, conflict that um, happened about 70 uh, and 80 years ago, it is very difficult mm. to uh, find um, war report data uh, because uh, no, none of the countries wants to um, uh, accept their share in the war <laughs> and uh, they uh, don't um, provide the data easily for others. And um, the data that I have found 
uh, yet. Uh, they are mainly uh, from historical books and uh, some uh, experts from different countries that I asked them to okay. <laughs> provide me with. This. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying thank that. You. Um, maybe going on to the um, Doug's question about responsibility mm -hmm. and a standard methodology yeah. for reporting on it. No, I think in, in in principle we should should follow the the line that you know the country is responsible for reporting the emissions where the emissions uh, have happened. Um, the interesting thing is now that uh, you know uh, Russia claims that these four uh, regions voluntarily uh, joined to the Russian Federation. So from following that logic, then the Russians actually should be reporting those emissions in their 2022 uh, inventory which is i think up next year so it would be or or the year up yeah, yeah next year uh so it would be very interesting uh, whether russia will uh, report uh, those emissions which they claim is you know part of uh, their country um talking about about methodologies um you know, you can have the most beautiful methodologies, but if you're in the in the fog of war, you know, how about your accounting um, and keeping track of, of of fuel consumption and keeping track of others? So, so I think there are some some um, you know uh, some some sources of emissions that can be maybe you know uh, uh, included in inventories under the sort of conflict and war uh, emissions. But of course, you will have to take into account that, yeah, during war, you know, uh, the normal reporting is also heavily impaired by, by, uh, yeah, the fact that the focus is, of course, not on uh, on bookkeeping uh, during uh, when you are fighting for survival. Yeah. Thank you. Um, would any of our colleagues online like to add to any of that, those responses with respect to responsibility for reporting and standard methodology? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if uh, we have uh, about the responsibility, first of all, a desire is needed uh, to change this. Uh, here at the, our conference, we are a specific community. We understand the specifics of the war. We understand uh, war-related uh, emission processes specifics, but not everyone is like that. Uh, several times I received feedback, uh, for example, that uh, this is my emotion, that uh, science should be uh, politically neutral, etc. Yeah, I can add just, <clears throat> we developed a national landscape fire management uh, strategy for Ukraine before the war. And we underlined that for the moment, even before the war, in Ukraine, absent a uh, holistic system of uh, accounting of uh, fires on all type of landscapes. Uh, more or less good accounting in forest fires and almost absent information on uh, uh, agriculture lands. Because of uh, agriculture lands is a huge gap in terms of fire management. So yeah, talking about responsibility and uh, who should take into account this, uh, we should say in case of a sound system of uh, fire statistics, landscape fire statistics exist, it would be much helpful to really see difference and uh, uh, this uh, additional emissions that uh, related with war. And uh, now we have no figure to compare with the pre-war period. Okay, thank you. I know you've got your hand up. Yeah, if, if I may add, add uh, like starting from the uh, question Axel's questions on differences uh, that yeah, at this stage of uh, research in terms of uh, war related emissions it's uh, like no, no surprise that there will be uh, significant difference because if you take 
uh, three uh, key elements like boundaries of assessment, activity data, and emission factor in all these elements, very different assumptions and very different inputs uh, could be used. Uh, so this should also be taken into account. And in terms of accounting of emissions and responsibility, uh, it's uh, like, I think that uh, the role of like various international organizations or institutions is important here because at the time of war, like the, the Ukraine for in, in, in this case has very limited capacity to deal even with the like regular task of uh, environmental authorities, for instance, uh, and not uh, often not able to, to devote significant uh, resources to such task as uh, emissions uh, accounting due to uh, obvious reasons uh, but in terms of responsibility for the for the emissions uh, themselves uh, i think that uh, here as we have like the well-known polluter pace principles uh, there sh also should be uh, the aggressor pace principles and aggressor should be uh, like Russia in this case should be held accountable for, for the emissions caused during the war. Um, there was, I think there was a hand at the back. Oh, yeah, I'll take one over here. Very quick question. We've got about a minute left. I do apologize. I've got to write down um, uh, which presentation actually was, but you mentioned um, what have been the emissions of the military equipment. I'm quite up in your presentation, Leonard, in terms of wartime emissions. How do you go about calculating those embodied emissions of the nuclear um, I, I give that to, to Mikola because that's his uh, his expertise. Did you uh, hear the question? Yes, if you could uh, repeat, please, oh. because it's hard to hear the, from the audience. I can't hear you. Just start again, please. Sorry, could you, could you please uh, uh, repeat the question because it's hard to hear from the, the audience. No. no. Can you try again, um, Nicola, please? Did you hear the question? Uh, no, can you hear me? No, we can't hear you. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, but maybe in the room, the, the it's not... Can, could could you please uh, repeat the question because it's hard to hear from the audience. Sorry, can you hear me, Nicola? Yeah, I can hear you well. It was about how um, you estimated the embodied carbon with respect to military equipment. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for. In terms of military equipment, um, uh, there are like two parts of the calculations, the activity data and the emission factors. Uh, so in terms of activity data, we relied on like open source uh, uh, data and incredible uh, work that is done by volunteers of uh, Oryx uh, website, which track every uh, piece of uh, visually confirmed damage or destroyed equipment so we calculated the uh, number of different types of equipment and the weight of this equipment and in terms of uh, emission factors uh, here there is a big gap in terms of like uh, research on emission factor carbon footprint of military equipment uh, so similar to the approach that was was used uh, in case of uh, norwegian study uh, we relied on uh, like proxy uh, data for civilian civilian equipment like agricultural construction uh, machinery that is like the the closest uh, type of equipment uh, we were able to find some emission factor data. So no, 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 no. We've, we've now actually um, finally out of time, and I know there's probably a lot more questions everyone has. Um, just to remind everyone, this is the first of our military emissions conferences. Hopefully, we'll have others. Um, and obviously, the discussions continue with respect to the challenges, with respect to collecting data and all the different methodologies that are out there and why we get um, different um, 
value sometimes. Um, so now we've got a 15 minute break. I think that's right, Ellie. Um, so we'll be back here at, four, at, um, at, at 45 minutes um, past the hour and um, for the final panel. Thank you.